after he saw as soon as he saw this man he was moved with compassion and humanity so he went to this injured man bound up his wounds and started pouring uh, wine and oil over the, his uh, the injured man's wound so in those days wine and oil was used as disinfectant just like we use detol or savlon today so this samaritan put this man on a on his own horse and takes him to a inn where he takes care of this man but the next morning the samaritan had to leave and while leaving he gives some money to the owner of the inn and asks him to take care of this man while ending this story jesus asks the lawyer that of the three men who met this injured man who do you think was the good neighbor so the lawyer said it was it was the one who showed mercy the good samaritan was the good neighbor so jesus said just go and do a like and you shall have eternal life so why am i telling this story i am telling this story because this story has actually shaped a lot thousands of years after in 1932 it's it's a very famous case all of us have read it in in law of torts it's donnie versus stevenson the snail and ginger beer case so in this case lord atkin the most famous judge of this case who was also a devout christian took inspiration from this story and brought in the neighbor principle so what was the neighbor principle just like the good samaritan was a was a good neighbor to the injured person the neighbor principle also states that we must take reasonable care to avoid acts and emissions which we could reasonably foresee that might injure our neighbors and who was a neighbor here a neighbor was someone who we are closely or directly uh who who would be uh, closely or directly affected by our, our acts and we should refrain from doing certain acts or while doing certain acts we must keep that person in mind so so this is how the neighbor principle developed from a story and like this there have been a lot of stories which have shaped law as we see today and it's not just the law you know uh, storytelling has in fact shaped human evolution and human civilization so recently i was reading this book called the sapiens by yuval noah harari where he speaks that 200000 years back there were three species of hominoids which roamed the earth but by 10000 bc only we survived we human beings survived and it was because of our cognitive revolution it was our ability to express ourselves and pass on information so even thousands of years back early men used to used to sit together with the elderly people with the younger ones and pass on their knowledge wisdom virtues through stories they would tell them how to hunt animals they would tell them how to make weapons where are the raw materials for those weapons found and this way storytelling has been passing on information from generation from one generation to the other in fact when i was young when i was in school we had a subject called moral science where we were taught virtues and morals through stories and similarly everywhere we see through stories we we learn a lot of things and even in in when it comes to religion most of the religion in the world evolved and spread through stories like in hinduism we have mahabharata ramayana even our vedas were passed on as uh, it was passed on very very much verbally it is only some 1000 to 1500 years ago that we had written them them down and codified likewise right now i just stated a story from the bible similarly there are stories and narratives in the quran which has led to the evolution of the sharia law likewise you know stories have shaped religious laws and customary laws and this has directly or indirectly influenced many of our modern laws which govern us today now uh, now let me go to the other part of my session which is legal storytelling so legal storytelling has a many facets to it and is applied by 
various professionals you know in day to day life they might be academicians lawyers law firms uh, law and policy makers judges alike but for this session i shall only focus on legal storytelling in case of trial advocacy only in the context of court rooms so if you ask me if i am to define legal storytelling i would define it as a persuasive narration which is bound by facts evidences and the law and with the ultimate objective of seeking justice for one's client now we all know that it's very important for good lawyers to be good storytellers and many say that art of storytelling is the secret of successful career in litigation we see our senior advocates in the courts who are brilliant brilliant storytellers who who can who can deliver flawless stories but but they learned this over years it's years of practice and experience that they have learned storytelling they did not attend a course on storytelling they have learned it through practice and therefore it's uh, legal storytelling is not not a cake walk although there are various techniques to it there are various techniques to it which might make it easy for a young lawyer who does not have the practice and the experience but there are also various other factors which affect stories so one such factor is called the rashomon effect so rashomon effect basically comes from a 1950 movie called rashomon it was a japanese movie directed by akira kurosawa in this movie a murder is described in four contradictory ways by four witnesses so so it it is basically about notorious unreliability of witnesses you know like you can see in a, in the slide itself like uh, if if you uh, ask a blind man to i a few blind men to or you blindfold a few people and ask them to identify an elephant and they go and touch different parts of whole different parts of an elephant they'll 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 have a different perspective for all the parts and it wouldn't make sense but all of them is convincing like a very localized example of this would be the bollywood movie talwar you know in that movie we had two narratives about the murder incident and both the narratives seem equally true and convincing so in such cases it's all about who tells a better story and who tells a more convincing story using all the facts evidences and the materials available now the question is how does a lawyer tell a good story you know and by good story i mean a story which is effective which is purposeful which is persuasive which is compelling factually meticulous and truthful story so there is no step by step formula to this let me make it clear but we do have certain basic ideas and techniques which can be kept in mind while telling a story in a courtroom so on this i would like to bring in aristotle here in his book the rhetoric he tells about three components which are essential for persuasion true stories those are ethos pathos and logos so ethos is basically your reputation and your credibility whenever a person tells a story um it makes a lot of dif difference by the person's character you are you will more readily accept a credible person's story than someone who is not credible like these is we have these whatsapp forwards where we see that a lot of these fake stories and messages are attributed to 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 someone like ratan tata why ratan tata because he is one of the most credible persons in india but recently i watched a video interview of ratan tata where he said he had absolutely no idea that he had been quoted in so many fake stories and tales you know then that that's what is ethos you know but uh but for ethos it takes years to develop and for a young lawyer credibility does not come in a week or a month or a year so i would like to move next into something called pathos pathos is the emotion behind the story while you tell a story you have to stir emotions in people like when we watch a sad film 
we go sad when we watch a funny movie we we start to laugh so 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 uh, i mean emotions are very important in a story and and you must make your story touching there are different techniques to it i'll i'll go into it further in my session and the third point is logos you know logos is the factual part of the story it is the evidence the facts and the arguments and the law i believe personally this is the most important part for a legal storyteller this is all in your hand you are presented with the facts you are presented with the evidences you are presented with everything you know know the law this is where a good legal storyteller has to weave a story and this is where you need to concentrate the most and make make up your story through using the techniques which i'm going to discuss now so the techniques are as follows so the first thing is that every story should have a central theme like in our good samaritan case what was the central theme the central theme was that we must love our neighbors so a theme like that has a broad appeal and can evoke emotional response in the listener yeah. and be described and and yeah. and yeah. that get questions in the end ha theek theek ha yeah what's up yeah uh so a uh, a good theme should have a broad appeal and evoke a emotional resp- response in the listener and uh, the uh, the storyteller must stick to that central theme suppose if you are trying to say that dowry is a social evil you must stick to it and not move beyond it in your story and the next which comes into it are plots plots i mean in any incident suppose a murder case there are different events to it where there was a conspiracy where there was a uh, uh the accused went to buy a weapon the accused threatened the victim and so on but these events are not always well sequenced there are many parts missing in the story this is where a, a storyteller has to play an important role while plotting the story you know it has to be in a proper sequence only this gives a proper structure to the story and the story will have a smooth flow then the next next important technique and i think it's a very important technique it's the use of words when you use words and details to turn the story into something alive you know like albert einstein once said that imagination is more important than knowledge while being a storyteller we must be able to provoke imagination suppose um, you must have read john grisham's novels you see how he uses words to make his stories come alive everything feels real so if you have also read something like the great gatsby or you have watched the movie you see that the way fitzgerald the writer describes the movie it's it's very interesting uh i mean he uh, the way he explains all the details it it seems as if everything is real and even while watching the movie the narration is such even if you close your eyes you'll understand the story very well and 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 this is how you have to make use of the words to make the uh, words and details to make the story come alive but however you have to keep in mind that do not overtell the story you do not need to put in every small details in the story all the leaves of a tree are not to be explained just just give incorporate all the basic facts there might be some good facts there might be some bad facts in your story which might be bad for your client it's okay to emphasize on the good facts but 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 do not go into all all the extremities the extreme details it's not required it's also important to tell the story inside out you know while telling a story you must make the listeners feel as if you are a part of the story you have been there you should not tell it from a outsider's perspective and always use present tense while telling the story 
and the next technique is it's very important to examine the characters in your story like like all the all the witnesses that you have in the story or all the other characters uh, like what are the biases that they have or or are they manipulating or are they being manipulated are they lying or are they delusional so you have to make those you have to examine those things critically in order to tell a good story and another important part is that you have to use you have to make proper use of your voice you know you have to change your pace and your rhythm to emphasize on certain parts of the story at uh, in certain parts of the story you have to be more aggressive while in parts you have to be very subtle you have to use silence in between so that while you are telling your story there is also time for for your audience to understand it for your audience to grasp what you already said and last but not the least one very important point i would like to state is that wit and humor is very important in stories and one finest example of this would be a great one of the greatest lawyers from bombay ck daftari he has used wit and humor in a number of cases one small incident i would like to put in here is the hearing of the bombay prohibition act which was related to banning of alcohol he said a very witty comment here he said a republic without a pub is a relic and and i think uh, well i just touched upon some of the basics of legal storytelling there are a lot more because of the paucity of time i cannot cover them up all in details but at daksha fellowship we are actually covering legal storytelling as an entire course and uh, that's all from my end now my colleague mahesh menon will showcase how these techniques are applied in real life cases and movies and over to you mahesh yeah thank you abhishek so i think uh, abhishek has given us a very neat overview about why storytelling is an important skill for lawyers and he's also given us some tips on how do we go about telling stories so let me try and give you two concrete examples of this i'll pick two examples one which is a case of a trial and another one which is uh, an appellate judgment and i'm going to pick two examples from two different countries one from the united states and one from india so firstly let me try and tell you the story of how is a trial shaped how is a storytelling actually going to determine the outcome of a trial and i'm going to pick a very famous movie for this purpose it's called anatomy of a murder now some of you may have already watched this movie but i'm guessing there are a lot many people have not watched it yet and i'm going to try and make a case for all of you to watch this movie mandatorily but not just for entertainment because i'm going to try and take you through how do you watch this movie and understand a, a, how a trial lawyer has actually shaped a strategy of narration a strategy of coming out with a story so that eventually his client is getting acquitted now why is it that i am taking a us story well let's be frank that there aren't really many indian good movies about trial lawyering and this is one great example so great that the american bar association has listed it as one of the greatest trial movies of all times what makes it really interesting is also the fact that this is based on a real incident and guess what it's based on a novel written by the defense attorney in the facts of this case the defense attorney was a very famous guy who then went on to become a judge in the united states he was also a prosecutor he wrote in a different pen name but it was a novel that was a best seller which was then made into a movie and this is a fabulous movie for us to learn how exactly does a lawyer develop a case so it's not just from the courtroom perspective it's really from the time that a lawyer meets a client comes out with a case convinces the client also that there is a particular narrative that we have to build goes about changing characters and building characters for the purpose of fitting it into the story and of course introduce facts and build a narration in a way that everyone is actually going to believe in the story right now united states as we all know is a country which has jury trial so that is a difference but then let's remember that the indian legal system is not too different from the way the united states criminal justice system works so at least it is an adversarial system we also have a system where the prosecution has to prove a case beyond all reasonable doubt a defense is entitled to remain silent the defense only needs to establish a case at the preponderance of probabilities and the general sequence of a trial is pretty much the same and then the prosecution will bring in witnesses they are examined first by the prosecution then the defense gets to cross examine them the defense may or may not bring about witnesses so 
broadly the sequence of trial is the same it's just that there is this thing called as a jury which is there which of course makes it more dramatic for the lawyers right convincing a jury involves much more of drama than convincing a professional judge so probably the degree of storytelling capability is required in india is greater compared to a set of layman judging it's a professional judge who's taking that role and still this is a great movie for us to learn how a lawyer works to build a story right so the story of the movie really starts with this guy the lawyer paul deegler who used to be a prosecuting attorney but he has lost his election now the united states has this funny system where in some jurisdiction the prosecutor is also elected to his office paul deegler held that office for a very long period of time but then he lost the election so basically now he is stealing at home spending most of his time drinking away or going out fishing so one evening when he comes back there is a client who is waiting for him it's this woman named laura laura says that her husband who is a person in the military someone named uh, a kata he has actually been held uh, by the police for committing murder now what has he done he has actually shot a bar keeper to death right so the police has nabbed him and kept him in prison and laura wants to hire paul bigler as his lawyer so initially bigler is a little reluctant to take on the case but then finally he gets interested and so he goes and meets the person and confirms well he admits that he did shot to shoot him so it looks like a straight case and paul bigler is a bit confused now how do we build a defense so he goes back to his library does a lot of research and figures out that there is this interesting defense called as an irresistible impulse the idea that if someone is moved by an impulse which is so irresistible he doesn't even remember what happened uh, he can actually be acquitted so it's a variant of the defense of insanity so paul beekler goes up to the client and suggests to him in fact that well were you really acting under an irresistible impulse and he promptly responds and says that yeah because i actually shot him to death because he attempted to rape my wife right so paul beekler then confirms the idea that we can make a story of irresistible impulse that uh, the uh, accused person in this case had actually gone ahead and shot the victim because the victim tried to rape his wife and he was so angry about it he just nabs a gun he goes and shoots this guy and he can't even remember doing that so that's where he starts building his case but it's not as easy as just having a simple story because now you need to also have a convincing story about it So what's the first thing that he has to do? He has to, in fact, change the character of the wife, Laura. Laura is actually a very smart, pretty young, outgoing woman who frequents a lot of bars. Who's actually also a bit flirty. And when this case is going on, Paul actually sees her at a bar and sees that she is having a lot of fun. So Paul walks up to her and says that, "Well, you are never going to win this case if you are going to portray yourself as this very liberated woman who is hanging around and having fun when the husband is in jail." so laura is actually instructed to change her appearance dress more modestly wear a hat wear a pair of specs and appear like this very conservative good wife in court room and that's one of the first thing that paul does to really change the outward character of laura so that she looks like this really good devoted wife who will be committed to her husband now the trial starts but there is a big unexpected twist and turn that the prosecution is not interested in going into the motive students of criminal law know that motive is not really relevant for the purpose of a criminal prosecution it's just enough that you establish an actus and a mens rea motive is not relevant for the purpose of determining culpability now the prosecutors two in number one guy is actually brought in from a bigger country from a bigger uh, city for the purpose of leading this case someone named mr dan so who's a very smart lawyer he senses that the best way to go ahead with this case is not to talk about motive at all So the prosecution just starts off the case by examining a witness who is a doctor who conducted the autopsy. So the doctor will come forward and he just says that, uh, well, I examined the corpse and I found these bullets and probably this is the gun that has been used to fire these bullets. We also find that there are fingerprints, etc., etc., and so on. Now Paul starts cross-examining this doctor, firstly with the question about. well when you examined the corpse did you find any evidence that he has he had engaged in sexual activity recently this is when the prosecution objects says that what is the purpose of this question that when paul breaks the idea that well our defense really is that um, the accused shot the victim because the victim tried to rape his wife 
So there was that anger and yet only trying to establish the facts around that. Prosecution objects saying that that is irrelevant. Well, Paul successfully convinces the court that no, it is relevant because to get to the core of his defense, establishing the facts which led to this outcome is supremely important. And the court agrees with it. And once the court agrees that motive is also relevant, Paul has his job a little bit easy because he's able to adduce a lot of evidence which shows that, well, probably there was a flirtatious incident between her and, and the wife and, and Paul was very, and, and the accused was uh, very angry about it and that there was probably an incident where this person tried to harm the wife and that is what led to the murder. But then, so that's what, even when there are these unexpected kind of events, it's important for the lawyer to keep developing the story and use the available set of characters to bring in your plot. Well, even when you're taken by surprise, you have to think on your feet. Well, then there can also be introduction of new characters. So Paul goes around doing his research and finds that uh, the person who is now running that bar uh, where the accused was shot is actually the daughter of the accused. And the daughter might be a potential witness. Right. So Paul manages to convince this daughter to come and sit in the courtroom and observe the proceedings. And of course, the daughter is really angry that, his father, that her father has been shot dead. But as the trial proceeds, the doctor realizes that probably there is a shade of truth that her father did try to rape this woman. So then this woman is also now willing to go and, and give evidence to the fact that there is, there is probably her father did try and attempt to rape the wife. Right. So this is how the lawyer slowly built this character. And very importantly, the lawyer himself was a character. There were these two really smart prosecutors who were trying to take him on. Every time that he was cross-examining a witness, both these lawyers kept interrupting him, raising a lot of objections. And he makes this really smart remark that, well, look at me, I'm just this humble country lawyer facing this battery of prosecutors from the big city, and I need more leg space. And the court actually agrees with it. The court says that only one lawyer at a time can object and conduct the proceedings. Right. So look at the way these guys actually built the character. Uh, the lawyer was able to build a defense from the scratch, introduce characters and shape them in a way that they will support the whole case. Even when there were surprises that were launched at him, try and build the narrative back by at times making himself look like a victim, at times building new witnesses into the scene, but always keeping a thread intact. What happens in the end? Well, I'm not going to tell you that because I want to leave you with a little bit of curiosity. I want you to go and actually watch this movie. And when you now watch this movie, the things to look out for is how a lawyer start building a character, building a narrative, and try and fit all the evidence that emerges into his plot. Yeah. So that's one example. Second example that I want to draw on is an Indian case, a very Indian story. We don't have access to the trial records. We only have access to the High Court judgment, which is an appellate judgment. But still just reading the judgment gives us a lot of insight into a the story is built. Before I go into the facts of the case, let me actually ask this question. So can I get away with murder because I thought that I'm killing a ghost? No, I actually killed a person thinking that he is a ghost. And now can I have a defense that I was acting under a misimpression? Because the law, as it stands, section 79 of the IPC, it says that if you are doing an act under a mistake of fact, believing himself justified that he can do it, then you are actually exonerated. Yeah. Now let's look at the facts of the case. It's exactly this, that a person kills another person and grievously injures two others thinking that they were ghosts. Now can he get the benefit of section 79 of the IPC? Well, what the lawyers in this case looked at is, they closely looked at section 79. And just to go back to it, it says that it has to be done in good faith. So there has to be a mistake of fact and the mistake of fact has to be done in good faith. So the key question is, can in good faith, can someone really claim that I thought that X was a ghost and that's why I attacked the ghost thinking that I'm only attacking a ghost. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a person and now I'm responsible for killing someone. Now the standard of good faith is really, the law says, has to be judged person to person. That there is no universal standard for this. We need to look at the peculiar nature of each individual who is involved in it, judge what is the place that he comes from, and then take a decision on whether he was acting in good faith or not. 
So if you just hear the facts, then says that a person ends up killing another person and injure, grievously injuring two others because he thought that they were close. And then, you know, that leads to death. Can someone be charged and held guilty of murder? Just hearing these facts, our impression would be, or the first response would be to say that, yes, he must be held guilty of murder. But look at the way that lawyers actually built that story. First, the setting. Our story unfolded in a remote village where there is, uh, you know, it's, it's a really small village in one of the districts of Orissa where there is this aerodrome that has been left empty, that is abandoned. So it's a really empty place. There is a haunted looking building, no lights around right in the middle of the village. And there is a story in that village that this aerodrome is haunted. A lot of villagers really believe that the aerodrome is haunted. So no one really goes near the aerodrome anywhere at night. People are really scared and they keep off the place. Secondly, the incident itself. What happened is there is this really dark pitch of the night when a group of people, they're all, you know, there's, they're all a little scared to actually go near the aerodrome. But there is a bunch of persons who are interested in going there to see the ghosts, to actually interact with the ghosts, right? And as they walk towards the aerodrome, they see these flickering lights at a distance. So everyone thinks that these are ghosts. And amongst these better bunch of people, there is our accused Ram Bahadur Thapa, who is a Nepali Gurkha. He is landed up in that place along with his master, who is a Bengali chap, who has come to pick up scrap from the airport and sell it off in the market. And he is a devout follower of his master. The master is also a strong believer in the idea that there are ghosts. And that's why the master wants to go to the aerodrome to see the ghosts. And the Nepali Gurkha is also absolutely convinced of the idea that there are ghosts, but he is a brave man. So as he sees these flickering lights at a distance, he gets up, he grabs his kurki and starts attacking these lights. Unfortunately for him, of course, he turns out to be real human beings. There were a bunch of people who had gathered under a tree for the purpose of collecting some, some flowers in the middle of the night and they had lit some lamps. So these apparitions that everyone thought were ghosts and Rambahadu Tapa was really convinced that they were ghosts. He was accompanying his master for the purpose of seeing ghosts. He goes and attacks them and unfortunately that results in death and grievous hurt. It's with these, these, you know, when you weave all these things together, you see that Ram Bahadur Thapa was acquitted. Look at the setting, look at the person, look at the character. You're building the character of a person who is really convinced about ghosts. Someone who's not very educated, someone who's really a believer of whatever his master says, someone who will follow his masters to see the ghosts. So Ram Bahadur Thapa really believes in ghosts. Look at the overall setting, it's, it's an abandoned aerodrome, looks like a very creepy place, it's far away from all the city, there are, there's no electricity, there's not much of civilization around, so it's really dark, it's the dead of the night, someone is going to see the ghost, and the brave man goes and attacks them. And the court agrees with the idea that he was acting in the good way. For a man with the capacity, belief and intellectual attainments of Ram Bahadur Tapa, the court felt that it's very likely that he was really convinced about the story and that is why he was acting in that manner. And the court ultimately acquitted him. So what are the points for us to remember at the end of this? Go back and watch the movie, Anatomy of a Murder, and look for how the lawyer unfolds a certain story. How he thinks of a certain legal defense and then he sees the need for building a narrative around it. How he fits characters into that narrative. How he ensures that he is in control of the way the story ends. Similarly, when you're reading cases, look for how a story is built. It's not just about the legal points that are decided in the case. It's also about the way how facts are presented in a certain order, how characters are built in a certain way so that a particular interpretation of those facts and those characters seems like the most probable and possible version that one can believe. And of course, don't forget the law. At the end of the day, the lawyers in both Ram Bahadur Thapa as well as Anatomy and Murder, they were very clear with them. They knew what were the intricacies of the defense that were involved. They spent a lot of time researching on how to, what is the exact legal point that needs to be pursued. And then of course they use their imagination to do the story. So these are the things that I would sum up with. And I would request all of you to try and go back and watch this movie. It's a great movie to watch. Also read this case and in future when you start reading cases, think of how stories are built. Also think of how whether these stories could have been told in a different way if you were the lawyers or not. That's how you train your imagination, build the skills to make a story. Okay. So I'll stop here and I'll now hand over to Archana, 
who will give you some ideas about how you build stories when you are making a policy narrative yeah archana you are on mute thank you mahesh for that um so i think uh, with abhishek and mahesh so what they have actually done is that they have set a very nice context right how uh, legal storytelling the frameworks my abhishek set a very beautiful framework for it he's set the context there uh, mahesh went about and spoke about uh, you know examples of how to really think about storytelling so now we'll move a little bit into the policy side and uh, think about it right so why do you have to think about the policy angle of storytelling in the policy act um so all of you are legal professionals most of you here i am assuming are students right and even if legal professionals policy is a very broad area number one and number two uh, even as legal professionals you will be involved a lot in the decision making uh, um, area right you will also be involved in the policy area so knowing what happens in the policy circle is uh, very useful from that aspect so with that um i'd like to sort of also talk a little bit about how storytelling is essential in the policy side right so now uh, just let's just finish off all the basics so what really is public policy on a very very broad sense right think about it everybody is saying policy 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 this policy that so what really is public policy right? in a very broad sense public policy is just the art of uh, trying to solve problems right which means you're thinking about what is the problem and what is the solution and what are the factors that cause the problem and how can you arrive at a particular solution by knowing what the problem is right um mahesh can you move to the next slide please mahesh yeah correct so yes so i think the slide sort of indicates that uh, you know this the, the art of decision making itself is a little complex next slide mahesh thank you mahesh uh yeah so i uh, no i think the next slide mahesh yeah thanks so i I'd, uh, i'd also like to sort of talk a little bit about a particular policy development that's happened in india today uh very interesting at that right um so the government came out with a bunch of economic reforms uh, very recently with a big package in the financial um finance ministry came out with all uh, uh and in day 3 if you see um one of the uh, so in day 3 if you see i think one of the very important uh, um policy reform that came in the agricultural sector um is, uh, uh, is 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 the proposition for a new federal law right to set a little bit of the context uh, so farmers if you see right if they're going to sell something legally um in a market uh, they have to only sell it to a buyer that's licensed by the agricultural produce marketing committee so this is been how it's been working this far but this has also led to a bunch of problems right and one of the problems is that obviously when you can only sell to a particular licensed buyer um you can i mean that leads to a set of i mean uh, that leads to monopolization in some sense right so the government sort of thought about this and clearly it has thought about this and there is a nice new regulation a regulatory intervention that they have planned in the sense of trying to bring about a new federal law they proposed a new federal law to bypass existing state regulations um and sort of you know consolidating the domestic markets so this is a very interesting proposition and this is also particularly you know solving a kind of problem so just imagine or just um sort of have this scenario in your head uh, and then mahesh can you move to the next slide yeah so now when we think about uh, this one particular scenario right uh, there is a very interesting argument that mekala krishnamurthy from the center for policy research has made she has said that the law uh, proposition is all great uh, but what the law or what the finance ministry or what the government has failed to consider at this point is that legal reforms do not necessarily address all the structural issues that are happening right and two uh it also discounts all the local and location specific issues um it like for example right the weather in tamil nadu is very different from the weather in punjab so a farmer in tamil nadu has very different culture has very different context has very different way of 
thinking about agriculture itself compared to somebody in Punjab, right? So the ecosystem itself is very, very different. And she says that the government has failed to consider all of this. And third interesting point that she also makes is that it does not consider precedent deregulations in the sense that, see, even in the past, there have been attempts to sort of regulate this particular market, right? And those attempts have not really necessarily yielded fruit. And if those attempts have not really necessarily yielded fruit, again, doing, making an other attempt is futile if you don't study the past effectively. Right? So the government has clearly not looked into that aspect as well. And finally, the fact that we are, we are a very diverse nation, we are a very dynamic nation, and there is so much uh, of diversity in this country has not been considered. And to actually have a federal law is a problem here, simply because of the fact that the diversity has not been considered, the context has not been considered, the past has not been considered, the location has not been considered. So a lot of sets I mean, a lot of feature sets and factors have been completely discounted and the government has proposed a federal law or a federal policy. So a th thought of policy for a federal law, right? So this is the scenario that I would like to sort of, uh, uh, you know, yeah, so sort of think about a little bit. Now, uh, next slide, Manish. Manish, next slide, yeah, thanks. So now think about the earlier government intervention, right? It said that there's going to be a new law. So now that new law can be thought of as a positivist framework in public policy. So what is a positivist framework? Right? A positivist framework, uh, I mean, just to give you a historical context, it uh, sort of started after the Second World War, this kind of thinking, where they said, you know, any hard fact or hard evidence you give me, any quantitative toolkits you give me, now, now that is the way to go about making policy, right? It is really independent of location, it is independent of context, it is independent of culture, Right, and everything depended depended on a lot of factual realities um, and a lot of quantitative evidence. Right, so it's value free, uh, it's context free, and there is a sense of detached observation. Right, so they were completely this kind of policy making was really dependent on a lot of verifiable data. So this way of thinking about policy was going on for a very long time. Right, which uh, Fisher, uh, as the next slide indicates, uh, rightly talks as the tyranny of expertise. So he says that you're not really considering a lot of voices, but you're only looking at expertise in data in sort of quantitative evidence. There's a policy scholar called Fisher, and he has um, given a very nice term to it called the tyranny of expertise, where he says, you know, you've completely removed policy from people, and you're just making policy with a lot of hard data. So a lot of social scientists started thinking about, okay, so what really is um, an objective way, what really is an objective social science, right? And then they started thinking about that. They started moving into a new framework, which is a post-positivist framework. Uh, and if you look at post-positivism, right, again, um, as you can see on the slide, there are very different, many different animals there, and you can't have, you know, each of us are very different, and you can't have a single unified policy for each of us, right? So they said that facts are influenced by values, so we have to definitely consider context. We have to definitely consider subjectivity. We have to definitely consider value when you try and make policy. So you have to hear voices, which means you have to have a lot of democratic participation, which also means that you recognize the fact that the reality is the same, but you definitely recognized all the subjective voices that are coming forward. So this was a very new shift in policy approach. And to sort of go back a little bit and think about the earlier scenario that I gave you, this is exactly what Mekala Krishnamurti is also talking about, right? She's saying that you have to consider the context when you're looking at agricultural reforms in India, and you can't necessarily just depend on a hard fact, right? So now, with this setting of context, I would like to think, I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about where the art of narrative sort of plugs itself into this particular scenario. Uh, Mahesh, next slide, please. Yeah. So who really are policy analysts, right? Um, they're not scientists. Like all computer engineers, just because you're a computer engineer or just because you're a scientist, just because you're a technician and can read data, you can't be a policy analyst. Because right now, in today's times, you're occupying a very messy space. You're having a lot of opinions thrown to you. You're having a lot of facts thrown to you, a lot of beliefs. You're reading so much in the newspaper. There's a lot of positions, ideologies, rules, and connections, and claims that are being thrown into you from all the sides, right? So as a policy analyst, your job is to actually produce arguments, interpretations, stories, and recommendations, right? 
Why do you have to do this? This is because you assist in the process of decision making for the government or anybody who is at the level in at, at the decision making capacity. So with thinking of policy itself from this angle, right? Uh, and you think of yourself as a policy analyst, you also think of frameworks under which you can sort of operate or frameworks that you can use to actually make policy, right? And one of the very important frameworks is the narrative policy framework. Um, it's a very recent trend in policy making, even if you see the narrative policy framework, right? Um, I think it's uh, from, I think it's sort of picked up pace um, in the late 2010s, I guess. And right now it's, it's, it's very, very popular um, in, in, in as, as it's also become a very important policy framework today, right? So what really is a narrative? Um, so we are all influenced by a lot of ideas, right? And what people tell us, we, we are completely tuned to what people are telling us, right? And just to give you a, a particular definition of a narrative, if you see the slide, a narrative is a story with temporal sequence of events unfolding in a plot that is populated by dramatic moments, symbols, characters, and culminates in a moral, right? So there are, this is a broad definition of a narrative. So what really, so now that we have understood what a narrative is, we also start thinking about what narrative policy framework is. Uh, so uh, think about it, right? It's a narrative. I am actually giving you a narrative right now. Mahesh gave you a narrative. Abhishek gave you a narrative. So what did we actually do, right? We're actually trying to communicate. With you. It's a particular kind of communication with you, right? Where you know, you heighten certain elements of reality. Even when you look at films, right? Every film, it, you know, there is certain uh, certain reality that is highlighted and certain reality that's not highlighted as much as the other one, right? That's also because as human beings, we have evolved ourselves in the storytelling tradition. We are very, very, very used to narratives. We always think and think in terms of, okay, this happened, or this happened because of this happened, or this happened because of this happened. And that's why we are all very, very fond of grandma stories or your parents telling you some stories or even, you know, the fact that we have so much stories around us, the fact that there's so many films around us, right? So thinking of policy itself from a narrative policy framework is very useful from that sense because it's a very, very appealing, um, you know, appealing method to think of making policy. Itself. Um, next slide, please. Rach. So what really is this framework? Now gets, let's, let's sort of get a little bit into uh, theory, right? Um, so there are four steps here, just like how you, you know, sort of figured out those steps in legal uh, storytelling. First is you set the context, um, basically saying that, I mean, think about, again, uh, easier is that you think about a film, right? Uh, a film or, or a stage rather for that matter. In a, on a stage, right, there are a lot of props here and there, right? A lot of props in the stage. There's a lighting that's coming. There's a screen that's in front of you. So which means you set the context when it comes to policy, right? Identify your props. So in terms of context, even you collect all the facts that you want to use, right? All the information that you want to use because those facts are going to enable your particular narrative. So the next step is you identify plot points. So what really is a plot point? Again, think about a film, right? Um, a film is generally driven. So if I go and watch a film in a movie, I'm always thinking about, okay, so this film is a love story. Ah, this film is a thriller. Um, this film is a haste thriller. So there are many different, so immediately when I talk about a movie, I'm only talking about that one particular ideology. Is it a love story? Is it a romantic story? Or is it a thriller? Or is it some kind of an existential, uh, uh, you know, film that I'm talking about? Uh, so that ideology is the plot. Right? So what really is going to be the plot of your policy narrative? And when you talk about plot in a policy narrative, you're actually defining a problem statement. You're saying, boss, this is the problem here. And now I'm going to highlight on the facts that sort of involve solving this particular problem. So you're thinking about the ideology and then you're thinking about the problem statements. Right. And third, you're identifying actors. Right. Um, Identifying characters, again, think about a movie. When you're thinking about narrative policy framework or legal storytelling, it's easier when, you know, think of it from the perspective of a movie. When you're identifying characters, you're identifying actors, you're identifying uh, relationships. There's a, even in a film, right? There's a heroine and a hero. And then you talk about there are other 
um, characters. So you talk about the relationships between all of these characters. There's also a villain. There is a, um, you know, there, there are other complexities in these relationships. So you're identifying characters. And finally, in the narrative policy framework, you're thinking of morals um, that for that particular story. So in a policy setting, it's either a solution that you're giving to the problem that you've identified as plot point or a recommendation that you're giving to a decision maker. So these are the four steps. Now, to understand these four steps better, let's think of again a very uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, popular, uh, 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 not, not a popular, very current policy thing that's happening, right? The Arugya Setu app. Um, and uh, let's try and sort of put the Arugya Setu app in the context of, uh, uh, you know, the government's context. So imagine that you are a government uh, spokesperson um, and you're thinking of, uh, this app itself. So how do you build policy for this app, right? So that's something that you're thinking about. First, you set the context, which is basically you're saying that, okay, there's a pandemic right now. Two, you're setting the plot point. So now you're saying that, so there, are, there could be many plot points, right? You could say contact tracing is a plot point. Um, uh, what is it? Lockdown is a plot point. Um, so there are many plot points here, right? But what is the particular ideology? What's the particular plot point you want to highlight? So here, in terms of the Arugya Setu app, it is contact tracing. You're not highlighting lockdown. You're not highlighting testing, but you're highlighting only contact, contact tracing as an effective way to contain the virus. So that is your plot point. So now you're moving and trying to identify characters. So within the app itself, right? If you're a policymaker, who will you engage with? One, you will obviously engage with the state because you are also from the state itself. Two, you will obviously engage with the technology. You will engage with the engineers. You will engage with the product managers who are building that technology out for you. You are engaging with the public, which is the citizens, right? You have to tell them. You have to ask them to download this app, right? And you're also engaging with other policymakers who are going to give you a bunch of recommendations. And you're also engaging with activists. Think about it, right? Even within the Arugya Setu policy framework, today we have had privacy activists talking about how, you know, the app is not open source for Android, sorry, iOS, and it's just open source for Android. And is the app, you know, protected by a, by, by, by a legislation? So those are some important privacy questions that are also coming around this app. Right? So, which means you're also engaging with the activists. So, you've identified the characters as people who are working in technology, the state, the citizens, the activists, and the policymakers. And finally, you're building all of this into a moral. Right? So, what is the moral of the story? What is the moral of your policy narrative that you want to convey? One, please download this app because you can travel safe across the country. Or please download this app because you can identify the red zones around you. And these are two very important things when you think about uh, you know, the, the, the disease uh, spread. So this is a very interesting, typical example, a very popular example at that of what's really happening in the government in terms of trying to build it from the narrative policy framework. Uh, next slide, please, Mahesh. Okay, so now that we've understood what a little bit of, uh, you know, some policy theories, um, narrative policy framework, we also think about why do you actually want to do narrative policy frameworks? There are actually other policy frameworks as well. Um, right, but why specifically narrative policy frameworks? One, obviously, it's going to hold the reader's attention. Um, you're watching a film, you're completely engrossed in it. When somebody is telling you a story, you're completely engrossed in it. Like even um, look at this picture there, right? It's everybody wants to always hear a story. We are all telling each other stories, right? So that's a very uh, useful. I mean, it's so, so in that way, it's very useful. Um, and again, why narrative policy framework, right? Sometimes you know you have to convey technical information to the public and not everybody in the public is really interested in hearing all the technical information that's being bombarded to them, right? So you're effectively conveying some kind of a technical information. And for that, if you sort of fuse that into a narrative, it's easier for them to sort of be receptive about it, right? So next, again, why narrative policy framework? Um, well, who are who is your target audience? You're speaking to an audience. Right now, I'm speaking to students. So uh, even I'm telling you the narrative in my head. So I know that I'm speaking to students. So I'm actually drilling it down. I'm paring it down to the basics. So all of you understand. But if I'm talking to the government, it's going to be a very, very, very different voice. If I'm talking to a policymaker, it's going to be a very different voice. If I'm talking to the state, or sorry, if I'm talking to an organization, an institution, it's going to be a really different voice. So with a narrative policy framework, also remember that your audience really matter. Who are you talking to? What do you want to communicate? And because I'm talking to this person, because I want to communicate this, 
I am using this particular framework to sort of work my way around so that the other person on the other side is persuaded. It's an art of persuasion, right? You're actually talking to people. Um, next slide, please, Mahesh. Yeah. But all of this said and done, we have talked, spoken about legal storytelling, we've spoken about policy storytelling, all of that, right? This is just the basics. But now that you know all of this, right, it's also really, really important to think about the professional, scientific, ethical norms here, because you can't really construct a story out of thin air and go to the courtroom, or go to a policy setting and say that this is an effective story. You can't manipulate. And that is something that is really a matter of your own integrity. Uh, so don't forget this very, very important point before you indulge in thinking about or reading about legal storytelling or uh, the narrative policy frameworks um, that is there, that is, that, that is out there. So I think with that, um, and, and one more interesting thing is that if, uh, so at Daksha Fellowship, we have, uh, um, uh, so it's, it's not a traditional fellowship we're doing, right? Uh, we're just doing this because we do feel that there is a lot of void in the legal system today. You're taught a lot of laws, you, you know how to communicate stuff about the legal system and the laws, but do you really know how to sort of, per, you know, do you, do you really understand the art of persuasion? Can you fill all the communication gaps that exist? Or do you, are you also thinking about the other creative stuff that involves um, in, 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 in uh, sort of trying to litigate in a courtroom? And at Daksha Fellowship, we actually have a storytelling module. We have a very interesting lab called the Work and Wellbeing Lab, where um, you will be taught legal storytelling. Uh, you will be taught um, critical thinking. You will be taught to even manage your personal finances. So please do apply to the Daksha Fellowship. We are in the third round of our applications. Our applications are open. There's a 100 percent tuition waiver. And if you want more information, please do visit dakshafellowship.org. And not just that, even if you are in like your second year or third year of law, right? we have a lot of masterclasses. There's a lot of content that we have sort of uh, put out there. And right now, Loctopus is also helping us really build our content. Um, so definitely do check out our masterclasses. They're going to be very, very helpful. All our blogs, all our materials are going to be really helpful for you. So definitely, please do apply to the Daksha Fellowship and definitely keep in touch with us. We are all over the social media. Um, so thank you so much. And now I think we'll just go about taking the questions, right? So first one is, uh, why choose Chennai for the program? Uh, Abhinav has asked this question. Why choose Chennai for the program and why not uh, the legal capital or the financial capital? I think I'll take this question. Why choose Chennai for the program? I'm from Madras. Uh, it's a lovely city. Um, it's, uh, it's not as polluted as Delhi is. It's not as crowded as Bombay is. There's a nice beach. Um, there's, there are a lot of temples <laughs> uh, and there are nice people like us here. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of culture that's going on. Oh, also um, adding to it, party. just yeah. adding to it, Pondicherry uh, is nearby. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Mahesh, I didn't catch that. Pondicherry is nearby. Oh, yeah, Pondicherry is nearby. There's so many beaches. And see, yeah, it's a very uh, nice... Yeah, and even, yeah, even in terms of knowledge, right? Um, you have the Chennai International Center. Um, you have a lot of very very, very big libraries here, and there are a lot of very nice educational institutions um, that have that are sort of coming up here. So it's the hub for, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be the future hub for education. So definitely, uh, that's why we chose Chennai for the program, and we didn't want to, again, populate Delhi or Bombay, which is already infested with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a <laughs> lot of other educational institutions. So I hope that answers the question. Next, uh, Munisha has asked this question. I think, uh, Mahesh, uh, do you want to take this question? She has asked yeah. a question called... Can storytelling not become misleading and what? Yeah, so that's where the whole ethics part comes into the play, right? There is a difference between being a liar and someone who uh, tries to interpret facts in different ways. There is a huge difference between both these processes. <laughs> See, if that, that's something that uh, Akshay was also pointing out, that uh, the process of a trial is to discover the truth and uh, you go through a certain process where witnesses are called to court and then they are put questions and then they are cross-examined and you're trying to ascertain what they're saying is right or not, right? So th 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 there is probably no, there is probably some truth that exists but we're going to try and find out what it is. And it's our process of asking questions and trying to interpret facts in a certain way that makes it an ethical storytelling process. There's a difference between coaching a witness and suggesting something to a witness. You are permitted as a lawyer to make suggesting leading questions when you are cross-examining. That's something that the law allows you to do, right? 
So it is about walking the ethical walk properly. There's a difference between bringing a liar to court. There's a difference between actively promoting a lie and trying to interpret facts. Yeah. I hope right. I've answered the question. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, so again, there's a question from Abhinav Madhva. He's asking, how is it different from LLM from a reputed NLU or a foreign university? Of course. So what will you learn in an LLM? You'll, 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 you'll learn only specific uh, uh, sort of UGC approved courses, right? But at Daksha Fellowship, we have three evolving, emerging tracks. One importantly is technology policy, uh, which is not taught uh, as, a, as a very, very deep track any in any universities. Uh, uh, in India, it's, it's it's a budding field abroad, but I think we are the first university, I think, to, sorry, first fellowship launched that in India. Uh, the other one is a disputes track and law and regulation track, all of them uh, covering technology, having the pillar of technology behind, and we've even posted a data week last, a couple of weeks ago, so you might want to go and check out our YouTube to get more information on what we will actually be talking about when you join the program. Um, and having said that, we also have uh, labs, uh, which are not part of any of the LLM programs, right? They don't train you to communicate well. They don't train you to think about life and work in a very holistic sense. And those are some things that we're thinking about. We also have boot camps, like small, small boot camps for high impact learning. We also have lecture series coming up uh, with uh, you'll you'll get an exposure to a lot of industry professionals, and you'll get a, and we have an internship program going on as well, um, where you will be uh, in a law firm for two months, um, and you will be trained in a law firm for two months in your particular area of interest. And there's a global immersion program where you will actually spend some time abroad with a partner university, trying to understand what is happening in their policy, regulatory, and legal uh, um, circuit. Um, so that is uh, a very uh, important distinction that we sort of bring to the table from an LLM program. And we're also supported by a very uh, a bunch of very, very um, uh, erudite, learned people. Um, uh, we have uh, our founders, uh, K.V. Ramani, who's uh, the founder of NASCOM. We are supported by Pramod Rajinha. Uh, he's one of the co-founders who runs the Ashoka, who founded the Ashoka University. We have Mr. Narayanamurthy on board. We have a lot of other eminent personalities on board, and that's on our website. So I definitely urge you to check it out. Uh, I hope that answers the question. And uh, um, yeah, so there's a question from Anjali. Uh, I think Mahesh or Abhishek, who, uh, maybe Abhishek can take it, right? Um, Mahesh, I guess. All right, so I think Mahesh, uh, so you're talking about molding the cases. So as in the case of COVID pandemic, do you think virtual courts are more effective than open courts uh, in providing justice as the evidence can be easily manipulated? Well, I think evidence manipulation can happen both in, in uh, a physical proceeding or, or a virtual proceeding. Uh, and probably I think it's better that we have a virtual proceeding because we actually can have a recording of the entire proceeding that happened. Unlike the current way where there is a judge who sits down and uh, notes on the deposition, we don't really have a video record of what actually happened. And and. In that way, probably I think a virtual proceeding is a better thing to do. Of course, a virtual trial doesn't mean that everyone sits at home and conducts a trial. Uh, there are dedicated centers where people will have to turn up for the purpose of participating in the proceeding. Maybe as a lawyer, I can sit at home, but the witness will not be sitting at uh, her residence and participating in the trial. She'll have to come to a certain place and do it. So I don't think that, that virtual proceedings per se can uh, involve more manipulation than a physical one. Uh, probably, I think it's a bad idea to do it on a virtual proceeding because there is an actual recording which is far elaborate than the one that we have in the physical proceeding. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, there's a question from Vivek, which I think I'll probably take up. While doing the legal storytelling or narrative, um, do we need to look into the qualitative context or the quantitative context based upon legal and logical facts? Uh, but the way think about it, right, you're actually thinking of a narrative, but in a policy setting or a legal setting, you have to definitely consider both, right? Nobody discounts the fact that quantitative evidence is useful. Quantitative evidence, of course, is very, very useful. Data is really crucial in making decisions. But also remember that data is not the only sort of parameter that, or, or, or you know, the only sort of tool that you will use to consider your decision. You need to have a qualitative metric you also need to have a quantitative metric and you're trying to balance it out. And that is where your decision making capabilities come in, right? So don't discount qualitative metric or don't negate quantitative metric completely. 
consider both and try to arrive at a balanced judgment. That is generally policy making or legal storytelling, whatever you consider, right? Um, right. Uh, there is a batch size. Abhinav Vatva is talking about batch size. Um, uh, I think those information will definitely uh, sort of let you know when the program begins, Abhinav. Um, right. Uh, I think Abhishek, do you want to take this question from Medhan, who asks, how is legal yeah. storytelling different from um, normal storytelling? You yeah, so, so normal storytelling is a lot about, we uh, people tend who write normal stories tend to use a lot of fiction. But in uh, in legal storytelling, it's, it is very strongly bound by the facts, evidence, and and with with all the facts and evidence, you know, it's very ethical. It's 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 bound. It's well bound. It it cannot be very fictional. You cannot in a courtroom. You cannot make up make up a story. It's just that you have to use the facts and all the evidence and whatever you have, and and the plot which is there. You have to use that and frame the story. You cannot bring in abstract stuff from somewhere or something which is non-existent into it. Therefore, compared to normal storytelling. Which which can be fictional legal storytelling cannot be fictional. All right. Um, so there's a question from Rithik who's asking how are competing policy options evaluated in a narrative framework. So Rithik, I I think this is I'm I'm not sure if this is the right answer, but I do think that uh, uh, a narrative policy framework is a very fundamental base layer. To think of one policy and how do you build a policy recommendation for a particular policy problem. Right. Um, there are, of course, competing policy options and probably you go about building narrative frameworks for each of these policy options. At least that's how I would go about it. I'm sure that a lot of other learned people would know uh, much better. Maybe I can get back to you on that. Uh, but that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, there is a question from uh, um, Kaif. Uh, uh, doesn't storytelling and creating narratives inherently involve some kind of emotional manipulation? Could there be a balance between ethics slash morality and narratives? Um, would Mahesh want to take this question? I mean, I'd like to sort of repeat that. Firstly, you know, the, I think the question sort of stems from the idea that there existed one truth which is actually determinable through this process of uh, the inquiry that happens in the court. Or it's presumed with the idea that whatever the prosecution has come out with is the real story and that's the story that we should go by. Right, so isn't that manipulative then? See, in any courtroom settings, there are a bunch of facts which we try to decipher and we try to order them uh, to try and make sense of them. And if you ask me, if you, use the, if you want to use the word whether it is manipulative, well, yes, both sides are trying to manipulate. Manipulate either the jury or the judge. But the whole point is that you are entering into a forensic process. And it's thought that the forensic process where there are certain rules that are set. You know, there are some rules that are set on who can come to court and give evidence. What are the things on which someone can give evidence? What particular statements made by a person are admissible in evidence? Right. All of these are set down by the law. And the game that we play around is what is the probative value that can be attached to the evidence that's given to someone. If you've learned the law of evidence, we know that there is this difference between admissibility of evidence and the value of evidence itself. Something might be admissible, so a witness comes to court and says that, I saw X happening. Now, whether we need to believe the witness, even if we choose to believe the witness, how much of attribution on just, just what is the value of that statement is altogether a separate question. And that's the space where we build our narrative capacity. And that's where they we use our narrative abilities. Right? So it's, it's not really a game where you're just out there manipulating everyone and everything. It's a system where the law has set down the broad rules within which you play your game. It allows you to have a forensic process for the purpose of discovery of truth. And it's thought that this is the process that is going to give us the truth. Yeah. All right. Um, so is there something for judicial aspirants too is a question, but we're not able to clearly understand the question, so I'm going to skip that. Um, Pankaj has asked this question, and what is the duration of the course? Uh, the duration of the course is one year. Is it online? No, it's not online. 
um, after this course, what is the job prospect? So you have internships uh, where you will be interning with a law firm for about two months, two to two and a half months, span of like eight to nine weeks. Uh, a law firm, uh, and it is uh, so. We are also looking at. We also have a career development office, which will totally assist you um, in finding a job. Uh, and the, you know, if you perform at the law firm very well, and if the law firm is also happy with law firm or any company, technology company for that matter, is very happy with the for the work that you have done, you could actually convert that into a job offer. So that's really up to your skill skill set. Uh, but we do, of course, have a career development office to definitely help you out with uh, uh, you know a future career. Uh, uh, option, right? And uh, uh, Akansha, you're in your third year. Can I apply for the fellowship? Um, uh, I'm I, unfortunately this, this this fellowship is one year and it's residential. So please finish your LLB and do apply to us. We'll make sure to consider your application. Um, Monisha uh, has asked this question uh, with changing times and upcoming e-hearing concepts. Would the legal storytelling also have a different um, dimension altogether? Uh, Mahesh, Abhishek. I think uh, even uh, if e uh, since e hearing and things like that have come, uh, but the basics and the techniques of legal storytelling are not going to change. Although there are certain things like in the courtroom when you are physically present, your body language and everything matters. But in e hearing, that's not there. But some certain things like like considering all the facts or or focusing on the main theme or the essentiality of the plots going into details turning words into pictures these things are not going to change even if it's e hearing or whether it's it's physical hearing but yes from yeah but the your body language where which you can present yourself in the court yeah on online it's it's pretty different yeah so probably then it's about actually uh, figuring out how do we practice this in the online space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. So there's a question on how to make uh, from Brinda on how to make a story more convincing. I think I'll take the question. How do you make a story more convincing? Right. Uh, I think you have to be sincere first. What you're talking about, because when you're talking in a legal setting or a policy setting, at the end of the day, you're actually making decisions for yourself and for other people which means there is an ethical moral aspect that is definitely coming into play when you're talking about when you're when you're actually giving them a narrative but to make it more convincing be sincere know your facts and see how you can employ a little bit of dramatics which has been employed in courts before as well but i can't recall a particular policy setting that's employed this kind of a technique maybe even the recent one uh, that happened in england between uh, the the the, the uh, cummings incident if you're aware of it dominic cummings uh, from the uk uh, uh, government sort of uh, violated the lockdown and he was going all about uh, the city, gallivanting all about the city, of course, for, according to him, for a very particular moral reason. Um, but then his story was not really convincing to the audience because they were really afraid of their lives and about, you know, getting the disease themselves. And here is a legend. I mean, here is somebody from the government who's actually violating a lockdown. So he was really not sincere with his explanation. So if you really want to sort of try and think about a convincing story, you have to really be very sincere in what you're talking about and really appeal to the sentiment and the emotion of those people who are listening to you. So know your audience really well. Think about whose emotion you're appealing to and what their mental makeup is. And this sort of definitely requires a little bit of judgment skills, a little bit of psychological sort of even, uh, you know, delving a little bit into psychology and psychological theories. So that's how you, uh, I think, uh, you try to sound, make, a, make a story sound uh, more convincing. Um, there's a question from uh, uh, Ankit. Isn't it a more one-to-one -one interaction thing? And how will you teach it in an online class? Uh, if you're talking about the fellowship, it's not an online fellowship, Ankit. Um, yeah, so uh, Ashrut is asking a question uh, on how a person can make the other person believe that the plot you're trying to set in a storytelling is actually correct, but on the contrary, the case is very difficult to prove it. Uh, Mahesh, do you want to take the question? I'm not able to follow. Yeah, even I'm not very clear about the question. Yeah, uh, sorry, Ashrut, the question yeah, is not very yeah. clear. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, anonymous attendee is asking, how can I participate in your online internship program? There is no online internship program. We run an offline fellowship with 100% tuition waiver, and we're not doing anything online. Um, and if we are doing online, we'll let you know. So there is a, uh, are you providing? 
Okay, so I think there's one question on what should be the specific ingredients that a story should contain that makes its narration interesting for the listeners? What kind of research is required so that effective storytelling can take place and how the legal storytelling can help in evolving a new law which is not existent? Um, Mahesh, would you answer the question? Uh, I'll try. So for one thing is the plot itself. Yeah. Uh, what you suggest as to build as a story uh, should be first of all, sound believable. I mean, something like aliens came and abducted me when I was walking on the road. Works only in science fiction. Or, or only when you're trying to write a comic book. But you can't do that when you're trying to do legal storytelling. It has to be grounded. It has to really sound plausible in the first place. Something that, that can, in fact, happen in the real world. I think that's the first thing to look at. Secondly, what kind of research is required? Firstly, you know, when we are trying to do it in litigation, remember that it's so objective. We need to establish a certain understanding of facts. We want to under, uh, establish a certain narrative, and that's the reason why we are telling stories when we are in a book. So the first step is to actually figure out the law properly, to understand what are the contours of your case, your, the legal basis of your case, whether you are uh, for a petitioner or whether you are going to respond it, to be very clear of the legal elements. Secondly, then see whether the facts can be interpreted or or brought out in a way that it satisfies the legal elements that you are looking for. So that's the second thing. Thirdly, then of course, you need character. The set of people who are involved in it and the behavior that you're suggesting should match. Right? It should sound very believable that this particular individual has done that particular thing or he has said this particular word. So the language that they speak, the way their mannerisms are, they all should match together. So the chief ingredients are a believable plot, set of characters that are believable, and of course, it should be tied up to the real world. Thank you, Mahesh. And I think this is the last question we will take, and then we'll wind up. Um, with reference to pol the privacy concerns in the Arogya Setu app and the policy behind it, um, to what extent does activism impact policy making? And a bit of a tangent here, how is one assured that ethics are followed in policy making? So the first answer, I think, is that to what extent does activism impact policy making? It does impact a lot. The government is listening. Like for example, I think just about two days ago, we had uh, uh, the source code open for Android. I'm not sure if it's out for the iOS yet, but that is a huge victory for policy activists. So people are taking note, people are listening, and there is a lot of action that's happening in terms of policy activists trying to build, I mean, trying to bring these issues to the fore through media. The social media channels have played a huge role um, in sort of, uh, you know, helping the policy activists put their narrative forward, right? Um, and the answer to the second question and a bit of a tangent here, how is one assured that ethics are followed in policy making? See, the, the idea of ethics itself is a very, very dicey idea, even if you look at jurisprudence, right? What really are you talking about when you're talking about ethics, right? Talking about, are you talking about the idea of good? Are you talking about the idea of, uh, you know, virtues? So what are these virtues really, uh, right? Uh, maybe a personal answer that I would give you is that if it's, if it, if it, if it benefits um, people, uh, if, it, if it makes sure to hear all the voices of people who are uh, uh, the dominant voices and also the not so dominant voices, the marginalized voices, I think that's a very, very ethical framework um, in policy making that can be built for starters. Uh, I think with that, uh, from our side, we'll definitely wind up the session. We look forward to uh, uh, having your applications at Daksha Fellowship and have seen most of you there. Uh, and I'd also like to thank, we'd also like to thank uh, Loctopus. They've been wonderful partners for all of us. That's, you know, for, for Daksha Fellowship, they've really, really helped us uh, in gaining the kind of visibility and to gain the kind of, and Tanuj is definitely, um, you know, sort of uh, personally helped us through all of this. So thank you, Tanuj, and thank you, Loctopus, uh, and thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, Archana, for those good words. Uh, and thanks a lot for taking today's session, Mahesh, Abhishek, Archana. Uh, I can see some wonderful comments just to add on uh, some information here. So this will be available on uh, as a recording on Dr. Pass's YouTube page. Uh, I mean, Daksha Fellowship's YouTube page can also host this. That's, that's completely fine. Uh, and yes, again, uh, you know, the reason why we have supported Daksha Fellowship so strongly and why I have personally also sort of, uh, you know, vouched for it is I know there are quality people involved or uh, there is some excellent curriculum which, which people at Daksha Fellowship have developed. 
so i would strongly advise people uh, to look into this to consider doing this and uh, yes uh, we hope to conduct other few sessions with aksha fellowship as well uh, it takes a bit of time and uh, you know coordination to plan as you can see you know such wonderful pre presentations so this takes a bit of time but yeah thank you everyone for attending thank you to again to mahesh archana abhishek thanks a lot for your efforts thank you so much for hosting us thank you so Very much yeah thank you everyone thank, thank you everyone. thank you for the wonderful comments thank you yes okay bye bye, bye.